Members of the Hangle fam are overjoyed since they have temporarily settled in a pleasant clean room somewhere in Gamebook, away from Hate Wang's territory. But they are only staying there for the time being to avoid their enemies. It's been a long time since they've stayed anywhere normal. Everyone feels happy except Daejin, who has his head lowered and seems uneasy. He still thinks about his former family. Daejin recalls the last time he discussed joining his new family with Tak and Diop. They, however, have their own plans. So Daejin calms himself and assures himself that everything will be fine. Midnight comes and goes, and Daejin is the only one awake. He decides to return to their room after hearing loud noises from outside the inn while contemplating on the rooftop. He is stunned to see a woman rushing towards him and suddenly hugging him on his way back. The mystery woman is bruised and trembling. She asks Daejin for help, but before he can respond, someone grabs her hair harshly. Her face grew pale, and the man didn't seem to mind that he was being watched while he abused her. The man's face wrinkles in wrath as he looks at the woman. While the man tries to seize the woman, the woman maintains her grip on Daejin. The man tries to slap her out of frustration, but Daejin grabs his wrist and warns him he's being too loud. The insane Dai demands to know who he is, but Daejin clenches his wrist even tighter, causing the man to kneel in despair. Daejin gives him a look he'll never forget, even in his dreams, and he flees in terror. The woman is still trembling after the encounter, but she appreciates Daejin for saving her from running away. The irate man calls Mr. Kim's number, who is known to be the one in charge of the woman. He apologizes, but what he heard has enraged him. Daejin, on the other hand, feeds the woman and tells him that her father sold her to a gang that forced her to do dirty work. Even though she begs Daejin for help, he refuses since his first goal is to protect his family. Mr. Kim appears out of nowhere and grabs the woman by the nape like a kitty. The woman starts shaking once again. Mr. Kim threatens her, but when he sees Daejin, he throws the woman to the side of the road. He accuses Daejin of caressing her for free, so he tries to smooch money from him and punches him. But Daejin blocks him and clutches his fist tightly. Mr. Kim, on the other hand, did not back down and tried to land a strike on him with his other fist. But Daejin is faster and successfully strikes his blow on his face, causing him to fly a little further. Mr. Kim stands up and continues to taunt Daejin. He is not afraid of him in the least. The woman watching them is still taken aback that someone can compete with Mr. Kim. While Daejin is quietly but annoyingly chatting to Mr. Kim, he sprints up to him and recklessly attacks him. But Daejin quickly dodges each punch. After attempting to hit Daejin, he grabs his wrist once again, and Daejin brutally punches Mr. Kim all over his body, nearly knocking him out. Daejin hits him till he collapses, then turns his back on him. The woman's mouth drops when she sees that Mr. Kim continues to march on despite the tremendous hits he receives. Mr. Kim tries to attack Daejin with a plastic chair on his back, she yells. Mr. Kim finally passed out after Daejin did a 180 degree kick to the face. The woman thanks Daejin, but he declines. She warns Daejin that Mr. Kim's gang is a danger in the neighborhood and that they may try to find him again. Daejin notices the woman's genuine apology on her face and tries to aid her by giving her her box of bandages before leaving. An old man lives in an extremely tall tower in Gamebuck and enjoys caring for his plants. He enjoys pruning plants and removing unnecessary parts, much as he prunes the girls before they go to their nasty labor. This man is the CEO of Woman Exploitation, Mr. Kim's boss, and he is in charge of inspecting the girls, including the strange woman, for dirty labor. The boss wants the girls to look gorgeous and sexy for the people who would buy them, so he punishes them anytime he notices something he doesn't like about them. He kicks and slaps them. He finds the weird girl with scratches and bruises and discovers that she is the one who attempted to flee in the middle of her service job. When the boss finds out, he becomes enraged and tries to stab her with the garden scissors. Fortunately, his assistant breaks through the bustle and informs the boss of what occurred to Mr. Kim the night before and they dispatch someone to investigate. The boss is keen to get rid of them after learning that they are just runaway kids who have never been spotted in their neighborhood. When everyone is dead asleep at night, the boss enraged men hunt for Daejin. They appear to be superior as a group. Their aura is powerful as they ascend the stairs. But before they could take another step, disaster struck. One of their men was already dead, and Daejin was already in front of the looking at them with his enraged expression that made the men tremble. Daejin's menacing and terrifying vibe pervades the entire staircase. The men are stiff and unable to move their bodies to defy him. They were once confident enough to run and finish the task. Now they are being pursued by a ravenous lion. 
The clock is ticking, and the lion strikes first, ruthlessly attacking them one by one. The men try to fight back, but they are unable to succeed. Dajin triumphs in the end. Before he could return to his family, a phone rang somewhere among the heaps of bodies. When he picks it up, he hears the voice of an old guy. The old man on the other end of the phone recognized Dajin the instant he spoke. Despite being outnumbered, the boss becomes alarmed to learn that Dajin is still alive. The old man retains the woman from last night as his hostage in order to scare Dajin away, and he threatens him with tougher men than the ones he defeated. Obviously, Dajin is not the type of person who easily gets intimidated. He informs the old guy that he has stronger men of his own who can send them all to hell. Gabriel, one of the boss's loyal men, walks in and is entrusted with murdering Dajin. The boss other guys are perplexed as to why he is willing to pay Gabriel more than he is now paid. Gabriel used to be a notorious criminal in another country, and murdering people is one of his daily duties. Gabriel gathers his strongest men and prepares to hunt and murder Dajin. He prays to God before going outside to welcome his men. His jaw drops as soon as he discovers them unconscious on the floor. It appears that they were knocked unconscious while he was getting ready. Out of nowhere, the enraged Dajin shows up behind him, and he brutally punches Gabriel in the face. Gabriel, who is quick on his feet and aware of the surroundings, manages to deflect the blow. Dajin appears to have grown tired of waiting for Gabriel to come to him, and instead came to their hideout. Gabriel had never seen Dajin's face, so he thought he was the kid his boss had been speaking to earlier. So Gabriel gets up and approaches boldly to Dajin, ready to fight. As their battle becomes more fierce, the night grows darker. Gabriel is determined to murder Dajin and return him to his father. So he rushes up to him and attempts a punch, but Dajin quickly steps back and kicks Gabriel. Even though he deflects Dajin's kick, he is certain that it will not knock him out, but Dajin is faster than the wind and immediately unleashes simultaneous heavy blows on Gabriel's stomach and lands a hard punch on Gabriel's face as he explains that he has no father at all. Dajin had no idea Gabriel would pull out a knife, which resulted in an immense cut on his arms. It merely indicates Gabriel isn't giving up. Despite the heavy, painful punches he took, he's still unwavering and willing to spill blood to complete his mission. Gabriel is well aware of the horrors he has endured since he was a child. With his horrible experiences and abusive individuals around him, the only thing that saved him from his hellish childhood was the wooden cross lying around the floor. At the time, he believed that Father in Heaven had sent him a task to bring the helpless lamb to his salvation. However, Gabriel misinterprets it, and the weak lamb is the people, and the mission is to murder. He believes that the only way to save them is to murder them. That is why he is determined to destroy Dajin and save him from the awful world. Gabriel takes a step forward and runs to Dajin, wielding his sharp knife. Dajin avoids it by using his arms to deflect every strike. Despite many cuts, Dajin remains still until he dodges every attempt Gabriel makes. Dajin trips over something and falls on his back, and Gabriel sees this as an opportunity to ultimately finish Dajin's life. But as soon as he lands his knife, Gabriel is surprised to see Dajin block his knife with a belt and kick Gabriel away. He provokes Gabriel to try to cut through the belt, so he does. As a follow-up strike, Dajin whips the belt at Gabriel. He blocks the belt and misses Gabriel. Just when Gabriel thought Dajin had failed to injure him with a belt, his face turned horrified as something pierced his eyes. Gabriel didn't know Dajin was holding the other end of the belt and swinging the belt buckle that pierced Gabriel's eye, but it didn't stop there. Dajin strikes Gabriel in the face once more. Gabriel, on the other hand, is certain that his men will murder Dajin's family at the inn. Dajin, on the other hand, gives him a devilish smirk because he knows his family is safe. Dajin reminds Gabriel that he is not the only one who has been through hell. He too had an unpleasant childhood. But Dajin is one step ahead of the game and knows what's going to happen next. So before heading to the enemy's hideout, he informed Dojiam that there are some thugs who will back up the thugs Dajin defeated at the inn. Dojiam is already there and ready to fight the moment Gabriel's men step forward to enter the inn. The men believe he is just a weak kid and rush to Dojiam. The man who rushed to Dojiam had no idea he was not just an ordinary, weak kid who plays tough. Dojiam mercilessly grabs the man by the neck and smashes him in the face. The men who have just seen it tremble because he is a monstrous murdering machine. Dojiam has a story, who would have thought he was such a happy little boy? Not until his father, who was a suspect in a hit and run, abandoned him. He was forced to travel by boat by himself. He was bullied and abused by locals at a young age while living alone in a foreign country. 
He believed it was the end of his life, but someone came to his aid, the person who taught him how to fight and transformed him into an unstoppable murdering machine. Dojium knocks out one of the men, and the other, who is trembling in fear, realizes he is only a minor. Their confidence grows, and they all attack Dojium at the same time. Dojium, on the other hand, is reminded of his past and how he was taught to fight properly, defend himself, and save himself. While reminiscing about his past, he mercilessly punches the man with a knife in the face, thereby removing the knife from the enemy's hands. He's more monstrous with a weapon this time. Another man approaches him with a knife, but Dojium slashes him before the enemy can even touch him. The last enemy standing had no time to attack him because a devil was already running toward him and giving him multiple deep cuts. The first man he punched earlier rises, but Dojium slashes him across the chest. It's belt versus knife at the hideout. The conflict between Dejin and Gabriel is becoming heated. Despite having an injured eye, Gabriel continues to fight. Gabriel notices Dejin repeating the same defensive patterns and proceeds to cut off the belt Dejin used to block his knife once more. In addition, because he cuts the belt in half, the hand Dejin used to hold the other side of the belt has a deep cut. Dejin's blood is dripping from his hands, forming a puddle. Dejin's pain is noticeable. Gabriel assumed he had already won when Dejin began to back away from him. Gabriel seizes the opportunity to sprint towards Dejin and finally finish him off. Little did he know, Dejin had intentionally skipped his step away from the blood, and Gabriel had slipped from the blood while he was furiously running forward and attacking him. Dejin tightens his grip on the belt once more and lands his final, most powerful blow on Gabriel's face, knocking him unconscious. However, it is not the end. There is one more foe to eliminate. The boss, Myongguan. Dejin walks down the corridor and finds himself in the boss's lair. When Dejin sees the boss, he becomes even more enraged. Myongguan did not even turn around to look at Dejin, he was instead looking at his dear plants, but he knew that his best murderer had been defeated, and he now refers to Dejin as a pest, just like a fly that he feeds to his murderous plants. Myongguan is proud to say that before Dejin, anyone who entered their territory was destroyed. Dejin, on the other hand, was unfazed. Dejin at all. Myongguan seems old, but he has a ripped body. He then tells him that he worked his way up to where he is now, doing all kinds of dirty, odd jobs to get there. It didn't concern Dejin at all. Dejin saw a band-aid on the floor and thought of the woman he met that night. Of course, as the man who held the poor woman hostage, he provoked Dejin by showing him the key to where she is and continuing to spout words that could potentially irritate him. Myongguan may be ripped, but he is too busy provoking Dejin that he lacks the focus to avoid Dejin's fatal kick. He is sent flying to his beloved plants with a single blow. Dejin successfully takes the key from the boss, but an unknown number calls him. Dejin answers the phone, curious as to who the caller is. Dejin, the cold, heartless, and merciless, erupts in rage. His eyes narrow as he hears a familiar enemy voice belonging to Yuzhan. The night passes quietly at Chilbong Inn until Yundong, one of Dejin's family members, awakens to find Dejin. Outside the inn, he runs into Dajiam. As a curious cat, he asks of Dajiam what he is doing outside in the middle of the night. Because their family is sleeping peacefully upstairs, they are unaware that men are attempting to murder them. Dajiam makes up a story to keep them calm, while secretly inspecting the bodies he disposed of on the dark side of the alley. Dajin was still on the phone with Yuzhong that night. Dajin's mortal enemy wonders why they left Gangnam if he is looking for him. But Dajin's family's circumstances have changed. They can't fight yet, so they left and went to Gangbuk. Dajin simply tells Yuzhong that he should be thankful that he is not in Gangnam and that he can live a much longer life. Yuzhong then attempts to provoke Dajin by claiming to be at Hangul's old hideout. Dajin clenches his fists even harder when Yuzhong mocks the way they used to live in Gangnam. Yuzhan tells Dajin that he needs to find him quickly because he is leaving Korea soon. In Korea, there are only a few businesses to deal with, so he's going abroad to expand his business and get into the top league. According to Dajin, the only way for Yuzhan to leave Korea is to die. The next day, Dajin surprises his family by showing them their newly acquired hideout, which was Myongwon and his men's hideout. They are all mystified as to how he found such a large place to live. Myongwon did not die, but he did save the girls by blackmailing him with his illegal papers. Myongwon is afraid of going to jail, so he has decided to leave permanently. Dajin's family rejoices once more as they celebrate their new home. They're like little kids who can't wait to pick their own room and fight over it with their siblings. 
Finally, a large enough living space for all of them. Daejin and Dojiam are discussing Yushan while the members are ecstatic. He informs Dojiam that Yushan will be leaving Korea, so in order to defeat them once and for all, they intend to strengthen themselves by collaborating with the four kings of Gangbuk. If Haegwang rules over Gangnam, the four kings rule over Gangbuk. Dojiam suggests to Daejin a strategy for getting the four kings to defeat Haegwang. Daejin wonders where he can meet the four kings, Unfortunately, he can't because meeting them requires an invitation. When Daejin decides to barge into where the four kings are, Dogium's face turns sour. Of course, the four kings' meeting place is a highly confidential location where no one would suspect them to be. The four kings are made up of four different types of people. They appear to be ordinary friends with distinct personalities. They're playing cards, and Mayol, one of the four kings, can't stand losing to the others, so he grabs his men and smashes his face into the table telling them there's a pest, causing the table to shatter and their cards to fly all over the place. Mayol claims he simply lost control of his strength and did not intend to do so. One of them becomes irritated and attempts to provoke him, but Mayol does not hesitate and allows himself to be provoked. A door flies to Mayol, and Daejin casually walks in just as they start fighting. Dojium had already warned Daejin not to cause any trouble or even use violence when meeting with the four kings to put up a good front and to let them help them get rid of Haegwine. However, it appears that Daejin disregarded Dogyam's advice. Daejin had just knocked Mayol out with a flying door. Everyone in the room finds interesting what has just occurred. Wonbin, one of the four kings, looks like to be a simpleton but is actually a powerful man. He orders his men to bring Daejin and Dogyam to him. His men quickly obey him and seize Daejin's arms. The men appear perplexed as to why Daejin is not responding to them or moving with them. Daejin simply stands firm and abruptly flips the two men aside. Daejin's harsh manner of removing them from his arm caused the two men's heads to collide with the floor, knocking them unconscious. Daejin's treatment of his men amuses one bin. Sian Kwan, one of the four kings, is curious about Daejin's origins and affiliations. But before they could know all about Daejin, one bin's eyes widen with excitement at finding a worthy opponent, and he wishes to beat Daejin and Dojiom to death. Dojiam attempts to avoid violence by speaking calmly to them and telling them of their plans for meeting them. When the four kings hear them discuss about Haegwang, their faces turn unpleasant. Dojiam knows why the four kings were created. It is to keep an eye out for Haegwang. Haegwang is a massive organization in its own right, rivaling the combined men of the four kings. To permanently eliminate Haegwang and Yuzhan, Dojiam suggests allowing them to use the power of the four kings. One bin refuses to accept their proposal because he does not want to risk his life fighting such a massive organization. When Dogiam begins to assume that they are failing to negotiate, Sun Yang Huan becomes interested in their plan, but he would like them to complete a small task before considering working with them. They request that Daejin and Dogiam to bring them a specific nuisance. Mayol eventually awakens from his unconsciousness with rage and searches for the person who threw the door at him. Sim Wang grins and informs him that they have already left and that everything has been taken care of. Daejin and Dojiam left the four kings' place peacefully, and Dojiam began scolding Daejin for the way in which he entered the four kings' area. Despite the fact that Daejin became violent, they were impressed with his guts. In order for them to assist them with their plan, they must locate the four kings' major issue, the one who ruined their business, Wiza Kang. The four kings' huge favor needs to be done in a week in order to consider their plan. Their problem now is locating Huizu in such a large neighborhood. Daejin noticed a loud man at a meat shop while they were thinking and looking at the picture the four kings gave them. Despite the fact that he is only looking at the back of the man, Daejin has a strong suspicion that the man they are looking for is him. They move closer to see who the hysterical man is, and as they get closer, they confirm that he is the man they are looking for. Daejin and Dogyam approach Huizu in order to confront him. They invite him to go along with them, but Huizu becomes skeptical and throws a pig's leg at them before fleeing. He is elusive, as the four kings have already warned the two of them. Dogiam and Daejin begin to run after him, but Huizu is fast and agile, like a monkey, thanks to his Parker abilities. Dogiam and Daejin are unable to keep up with him. Dogiam clenches his teeth as he becomes irritated, so they come up with a strategy to split their way just to corner Huizu. While Dogiam is running as fast as he can, Wizu tries to provoke him by jumping from one roof to another, which Dogiam is unable to do. Wizu thinks he's gotten away from them, but the moment he jumps down, Daejin grabs the plastic he's holding. 
Dejan tears the plastic by accident, and Huizu's eyes widen as he sees the meat he purchased flies and scatters on the ground. He clenches his fist and stares furiously at Dejan. Fists all clenched, Huizu Kang is furiously agitated about the pack of meat all scattered on the floor. Huizu Kang tries to attack Dejan by dashing forward by surprise, but Dejan is highly prepared for Huizu Kang's offense and takes up a fighting pose. With all his might and great speed, Huizu Kang tries to attack Dejan, but strangely enough, he only leaps past Dejan and runs away. All surprised by the strangeness of this encounter, Dejan couldn't help but freeze in place as he watched Huizu Kang sprint away from him. Moments later, Huizu Kang managed to escape from Dejan, or did he? Huizu Kang keeps his guard up, for he knows that the Four Kings will not give up that easily. At the gate of a house, he swears that no matter what, no one should find out where he is hiding. Huizu Kang makes sure that the gate is locked tight, and then goes inside the house before anyone sees him. Little did Huizu know that Dejan and Dojian were just several feet away, watching Huizu Kang at the top of a nearby house, both heavily panting and dripping in sweat. Dogyam and Daejin managed to track down Huisa Kang. But it was all thanks to Dogyam Bake's great tracking skills that he learned when he was still a kid. Daejin suggested that they should attack Huisu by surprise, but it was them who were astonished by what they found out. It turns out that Huisa Kang is simply protecting his grandma, who's suffering from dementia. The house isn't Huisu's hideout, he is just a simple, loving grandson when at home, genuinely taking care of an old woman all by himself. It was his grandmother's birthday, but since Huizu failed to deliver the beef that was supposed to be his gift to the old lady, he also failed to please his grandmother's better side, or what's left of it. All Huizu Kang can do now is hug his grandma tightly, hoping that she will somehow feel the love of her caring grandson. Meanwhile, Daejin and Dojiam see everything from Huizu's house, and Dojiam is in no place to feel empathy towards Huizu. But it was not the same for Daejin. It is subtle that Daejin has a soft spot for such a delicate situation as Huizu and tells Dojiam to wait. In the next scene, Saiyang Huang is punching a sandbag with all his might until the bag breaks off of its chain. It looks like this Saiyang Huang character is also interested in finding the whereabouts of Huizu Kang. Saiyang Huang asks one of his goons if it was Daejin and Dojiam who found Huizu, but that's not the current case. Instead, Huizu is spotted shouting and running like a madman on the streets as if he's trying to get everyone's attention. I am delighted by the good news. Saiyang Huang puts his attention on Huizu, all while stepping on the fallen sandbag that turns out to contain a person all beaten up inside. Meanwhile, Huizu is really, in fact, shouting menacingly on the streets, not to gather attention but to find his missing grandma. Huizu searches all the corners of every block and asks every person he can, leaving no stone unturned, but to no avail. The sweet grandson blames himself for being careless and not being able to make his grandmother happy on her birthday. He also blames himself for not thoroughly checking if the gate is properly locked, making it easy for the old lady to just waltz outside and get lost in the streets. Huizu continues the search with no plans to stop until he finds his grandma once again. Dusk turns to night, and only then does Huizu find his grandmother sleeping on a swing at a children's park. Huizu can rest easy now that he has finally found his beloved grandma but the knight proves to be still young as trouble approaches Huizu at the back. A swarm of goons instantly flocked around, surrounding Huizu and his grandmother. All armed and ready to wreak havoc, these goons were sent under the order of Saiyan Huang to capture Huizu. Outnumbered and left with no choice, Huizu desperately tries to make a stand in order to protect his grandmother and himself, especially when the commander of the goons directed that they would deal with the old lady first. Huizu's fists are now ready to crush some ugly mugs. But Saiyang Huang's gangsters are so proud of their numbers that they keep breaking Huizu's spirit by telling him how much they would hurt his precious grandma. The commander of the Guans initiates the first offense and swings his metal bat at Huizu until suddenly, Dojiam appears from nowhere and punches the menacing Guan straight in the face. With just a single punch from Dojiam, the commander of the Guans fell to the ground, unconscious. All the other Guans are terrified after witnessing such a devastating display of force from Dojiam. Huizu, on the other hand, is highly surprised to see Daejin and Dojiam coming for his aid. But Daejin claims that they just happened to be there to give back the pack of beef that Huizu dropped earlier. Besides, there is no stopping Dojiam now, especially after seeing that the goons are very willing to hurt one defenseless, fragile old lady. Daejin and Dojiam step toward the goons, and the night will surely be filled with blood and broken bones. Then, the story introduces the backstory of Huizu Kang, 
Rain was pouring hard that night two years ago in an alley in Gamebuck. Weizu, all drenched and alone, sits on the floor of the dark alley, severely wounded. It is supposed to be Huizu's birthday that day, but the celebration is instead a one-sided brawl against the four kings, which he definitely lost. At that moment, Huizu knew that it might be his last, but an old lady suddenly appears and covers him away from the rain. The old lady is none other than the grandma with dementia that Huizu is now taking care of. She took Huizu home, tended to his wounds, gave him a warm shelter, and served him a hearty meal. Thanks to this old lady, Huizu gets to live another day. And since then, Huizu has treated the old lady like his very own grandmother, his own family. Going back to the rampage at the playground, Saiyan Huang's goons are in a state of disarray as they question if Daejin and Dojiom are in the same gang as Huizu. But the goons decide that they still have the advantage in number, so they attack Daejin and Dojiom simultaneously. Wave after wave, Daejin and Dojiom effortlessly trample each of the goons with their fists. Even with Huizu, Saiyang Huang's goons prove no match for the three. One by one, the goons fall to the ground like dried leaves until a very huge man enters the scene. Jaya, one of Saiyang Huang's goons, boasts of his large build and confidently plans to attack Daejin and Dojinam. But the duo quickly lunges Jaya before the large man can even react. With just a single punch from Daejin and Dojium, Jaya falls instantly. Left with only a handful of members still standing, Saiyang Huang's goons retreat in utmost fear. After the battle, Huizu asks Daejin and Dojium for their reasons for helping him and his grandma. The two explain the situation as well as their plans to increase their manpower to go against Heguang. Huizu quickly understood the situation and also appreciated the duo for helping him protect his grandma. Moments later, Jaya calls his boss, Saiyang Huang, and informs him of the bad news. Saiyang Huang is highly dissatisfied with his goons for being such a bunch of failures. Jaya tries to reconcile with the boss by saying that they at least found out where Huizu could be hiding. And just like that, Huizu's house is swarming with Saiyang Huang's goons. At that moment, Huizu realized that his grandma's identification card was missing. This is now the main reason why Saiyang Huang's goon managed to track down his only possible hideout. Huizu had no other place to run or hide, and most especially, his grandma also had no other place to stay for the night. Daejin then decided to take Huizvi and his grandma to their hideout. Huizu couldn't believe his eyes that his grandma immediately settled nicely with Daejin's crew. It was Endon who was treating the old lady nicely making the grandma feel exactly as if it were home. Huizu approaches Dojiam and expresses his gratitude for taking him and his grandmother in. Dojiam doesn't see a problem with taking in the two, especially the defenseless old lady. What bothers Dojiam is that when the four kings catch sight of them helping and hiding Huizu, Daejin's crew will be an instant target for them as well. The bad thought lingers on Daejin until suddenly his phone rings. Daejin answers it, and on the other line, it is like when the devil speaks for itself, it is Saiyang Huang calling Daejin. Saiyang Huang gets straight to the point and asks Daejin if he knows where Huizu is now. Daejin dodges the question, but Saiyang Huang replies by expressing his great disappointment at missing the chance to catch Huizu. Saiyang Huang intimidates Daejin by letting him hear the savage acts Saiyang Huang is currently doing, explaining the gruesome act vividly over the phone with Daejin. Daejin stood there speechless for a moment until he did something very surprising. We caught him, he says, Saiyan Kang's eyes open in utmost excitement as he hears that Daejin has finally caught Huizu. Not a single person in that moment had the slightest hint of what Daejin might be thinking or planning. The only thing that is certain is that Daejin is going to meet one of the devils himself. At Deep Purple, a bar owned by Saiyan Huang's gang, a young lady named Yian Li is being interviewed to work as a bartender at that very bar. She's being interviewed by Deep Purple's manager, Jen Zhang, and assistant manager, Hai Song Li. The manager, Jen Zhang, is trembling intensely and shows no interest in interviewing the young lady. But He Song Li, the assistant manager, composedly took over the interview and hired the young lady on the spot. The young lady, Yi Yan Li, is delighted that she got the bartending job, and Hai Song Li immediately tells her to start right away. But the young lady refuses, as she already has plans for the night. Little did she know that her nightmare was now about to start. The young lady unknowingly took a drink filled with illegal substances. She instantly loses her sight, followed by the escape of her sanity as well as her consciousness. Meanwhile, at Daejin Crew's hideout, Daejin, Dojiam, and Huizu are discussing Daejin's plan to infiltrate the club of Saiyang Wang's gang, the Deep Purple. Daejin plans to go straight head-on and fight the four kings by himself. 
But Huizu warns Daejin of the danger that awaits him, and that Siang Huang is not to be underestimated. Huizu also tells of the tale of the young Siang Huang, and how this cruel man rose into the ranks and became one of the four kings. Siang Huang spent his teenage days mostly inside a detention center for delinquents. Except the young Siang Huang wasn't there to serve his sentence. He was there intentionally. Siang Huang used the youth detention center as his recruitment hub to build his criminal empire, which was later known as Lab H. He hands out illegal substances to all other detainees, and just like that, Siang Huang manages to recruit a lot of detainees as members and has now become a very strong criminal organization. With all that warning from Huizu, Daejin is still motivated to infiltrate Siang Huang's base since it has been something he must do in the first place. Dojium also reassures Huizu and tells him to take good care of his grandma instead. It wasn't enough to convince Huizu, but there was nothing he could do to stop Daejin and Dojium. Especially now that Daejin has the ideal plan for this mission. Seeing Daejin act mature and very composed makes Dojium nothing but happy and proud. In the following scene, Siang Huang's savagery and cruelty are further shown in the story. A lady with such a depraved appearance bows down and begs before Siang Huang. This lady already managed to escape Siang Huang's devilish act and manipulation, but decided to come back again because her addiction was too strong for her to resist. Siang Huang accepts the lady under the condition of becoming a slave for the entirety of her life. Shocking and absurd to the sight, the lady still willingly signs the contract of being a slave and starts working back again under inhumane conditions in the Deep Purple Bar. At the same time, at the Deep Purple Bar, Dajin guises himself as a normal customer of that very club. Dajin tries to blend naturally, but his saying a weird phrase makes him look weird at some point. He seems to be looking for something peculiar, so Dajin meets back with Dogyum, who is also inside the Deep Purple Bar. They're both looking for a place where a weird catchphrase serves as a password that will lead them into the bar's den. Daejin and Dajiyeom are just trying to rethink their plan until something triggers after saying the catchphrase in front of an unsuspecting painting. The wall suddenly opens, and a man in a suit greets Daejin and Dojiyeom. Either is a weird coincidence, or just some dumb luck, Daejin and Dojiyeom descend through the secret passage heading towards the club's illegal den. Before the rumble at the deep purple den starts, the story first introduces us to yet another flashback. This time at the youth detention center, it was the backstory of deep purple bar's heads, Haishan Lee and Jun Jong. Jun Jong is sent to the juvenile detention center for illegal substances, while Haishan Lee is there for fraud and violence. Both of them could never go along except for one thing, and that is money bride that is supplied and given to them by none other than Siang Huang himself. Since then, Jun Zhang and Haisen Li now work together as a team under the reins of Siang Huang at Lab H. Moments before Dajin and Dogium's infiltration of the Deep Purple Bar, Dajin explains in detail his plan. Should they want to gain a fighting chance against the Gangbuk's four kings, they must first destroy the Lab H organization. But Siang Huang's Lab H numbers were so great that Daejin's crew stood no chance of winning against them at all. Except Daejin knows exactly how to weaken Lab H's forces. If they take down Lab H's side gigs one at a time, Lab H's will crumble little by little until they finally fall into annihilation. But Huizu is still not convinced that Daejin can pull off something this massive, especially when all of Lab H's businesses are related to illegal substances. Not only that, Lab H also has a very influential web of connections among its members. Discovering the secret passage is one thing, but getting past Deep Purple's security is a whole different story of its own. And that's what's currently happening in Daejin and Dogium's current situation. A guard at Deep Purple's den is holding the two for inspection. Desperate and frightened of getting caught, Dogium starts giving the guard random, petty reasons. Of course, such a thing wouldn't work on this security so tight and Dogium's now on the verge of failing. Luckily, Daejin was bold enough to take the risk and mention Siang Huang's name as the one who gave them the referral. The guard suddenly apologizes and lets Daejin and Dogium pass and enter the den. As soon as the door opens, a massive surge of filth and illegal substances rushes from the inside. What's inside the den is so indescribable and inhumane, as if it were hellish, fiendish, or both. Men and women, all lost in their sanity, fill the place as the den's addicted occupants. Out of nowhere, Haishan Li, Deep Purple's assistant manager, appears from Daejin and Dogium's backs and greets them. Covered with a cloth on his face, the assistant manager gives the two a tour inside the den. 
The sights inside only get worse as Daejin and Dojeom follow the assistant manager around. Then they meet the manager, Jin Jong, who is, by the time, highly intoxicated by the lingering illegal substance. The assistant manager then offers yet another service for the two, which is being served by their female employees. A young lady wraps her arm around Dogyum's and tries to allure him. It is the same young lady from earlier who was just applying for a job as a bartender, but now she is only a mindless addict. But Dogyum grows irritated by this and shoves the young lady away. This now raises suspicion from the assistant manager. The assistant manager now takes out a syringe and fills it with illegal substances to inject into Dogyum as a free taste of the thrill. But before the needle could even touch Dogyum's skin, Daejin grabbed the assistant manager's arm and shoved it away. Daejin and Dojeon try to leave the den, but the door they came from is now locked shut. Apparently, the assistant knew their identities all along and is just following through with their act. Lab H's goons wearing gas masks quickly surrounded Daejin and Dojeon, leaving them with no room for escape. The assistant manager thought they had the upper hand now that they had caught Daejin and Dojeon isolated, but he was completely wrong. Daejin always wanted the situation to be like this, to save them from the trouble of searching for who's in charge of the deep purple bar. Daejin and Dojeon punched the goons of Lab H one by one. Both of their punches were so heavy and devastating that they crushed everyone who got hit. Filled with fury, Daejin and Dojeon rush in and face all of Lab H's goons inside that filthy den as if they're going to raise hell in such a hellish place. Cyan's men pursue Daejin and Dojeon one by one but they still manage to knock them unconscious. They believe they can easily defeat them because they are outnumbered, but Daejin and Dojeon are far stronger. One of the men sneaks up behind Daejin and attempts to inject a substance into him, but Daejin avoids being hit by the injection by grabbing the man's hand and injecting the substance into the enemy instead. All of the men are attempting to inject the substance into them in order to end the game, but they have successfully avoided all of it forcing the men to take the substance as a defense instead. Haijan witnesses their men lying on the floor intoxicated on the substance Daejin and Dojeom gave them. He becomes irritated because of the business sales, and his partner, the manager of the den, falls asleep due to the substance. After defeating the men, Daejin and Dojeom try to finish off Haijan so they can leave the den. But Haijan tosses Dojeom to the side, and the manager, Jen Jong, also wakes up. Flash back to the detention center and see how Hisong and Jun Jong had one thing in common. An unpleasant bastard arrived and started bothering the juveniles. He started messing with other people inside the detention center and stealing substances. He stole both Hisong and Jun Jong's goods. So they both went to where the man was. The man is bigger than them, but Hisong and Jun Jong are tougher. They were able to defeat the man's underlings and deliver a few heavy blows to him. The man begged to be spared. Returning to Deep Purple's secret den, Hisham explains why Daejin and Dojeom are unable to leave the room. It is their rule that if a sober person enters the trap, they cannot leave the den unless they are already dead intoxicated. Hisham is unconcerned about humanity. He is only concerned with business and money. Hisham tries to provoke Dojeom by threatening him to give up because they'll soon be intoxicated like Jun Jong, the manager. In some ways, he and the manager are rivals, but when it comes to money, they fight together. Jun Jong attempted to punch Daejin, but he was blocked. Jun Jong learns about their attempt to destroy their business and turns to Daejin with a menacing smile and wide red eyes. All of this is the result of too much substance. Dojeom, on the other hand, dashes up to Hee Song for a punch, but Hee Song blocks it. Dojeom believes that the two of them are incapable of defeating him and Daejin. Because of the smell of the substance trapped inside the room, Hizong's movements become sloppy. Dojiem is puzzled as to why, despite being a seller of the substance, he cannot stand the odor. But Hizong doesn't mind whether he takes the substance or not as long as he gets paid by the customers. Like the people who are in the den, they are all intoxicated and have utterly lost it due to the substance. Hizong dashes up to Dojiem and punches him right in the stomach. He refers to him as pathetic, just like the people inside the den. He strikes him with multiple punches, but Dojiem reacts quickly and evades each one, eventually punching Haisong in the face and knocking him to the ground. Daejin, on the other hand, takes advantage of his opponent's stupor and hits him multiple times in the face, grabs him by the arms, twists it to his back, and grabs his nape to bury his face in the wall. However, Jun Jong gives Daejin a creepy grin and look. 
Because he is intoxicated and numb to pain, he twists his shoulder and throws a heavy punch at Daejin, which he quickly blocks. Jun Zhong experiences hallucinations and crazy ideas as a result of the substance, which he uses to fight Daejin. However, his movements are unpredictable and sloppy, and Daejin sees this as an open opportunity to take advantage of flaws in his movement in order to defeat him. Jun Zhong continued his attacks with continuous reckless punches after he thought he had hit Daejin's head with his flying kick. Daejin is able to block them and eventually lands a heavy punch on his face, just as he thought he did. Jun Zhong's mouth has caught his fist, and he is biting him. Daejin is taken aback by what is happening. He tries to avoid Jun Zhong's crazy attacks when he is suddenly hit by He Zong's body, which Dojiam sent flying. Dojiam suggests defeating them quickly, but they are not easy foes. One is intoxicated on substance and one is crazy about money. Even though He Zong despises working with Jun Zhong, he has no choice because they are most powerful when fighting together. They become a murdering machine. Jun Zhong throws wide swinging punches that Dojiam thought he could handle, but Jun Zhong is becoming increasingly unpredictable and reckless. When Daejin and Dojiam thought it was easy to see a winning opportunity with Jun Zhong's wide swing of punches, they almost forgot that He Zhong was filling in the gaps and flaws in his partner. It's two versus two, with both being powerful and vicious when fighting together. Another flashback to the detention center, where Jun Zhong and He Zhong got along because of money. They eventually fought each other after beating up the man who stole their goods. Before they can punch each other to death, Saiyang steps in and makes a proposal that will benefit both of them. He suggested starting a business with him, but Jun Zhong and He Zhong were skeptical because they were mortal enemies who couldn't get along, and he was just a stranger to them. But Saiyang saw potential in those two, one who knows about substances and the other who knows how to do business in sales. It's a perfect synergy that could result in a lot of money. For the sake of money, that's how the two got along. In a fit of disgust, Dojiam takes a bong and hurls it at Jun Zhong and Hai Song for being so constantly greedy. Out of frustration, He Song sets up a new plan for their business, which involves making Daejin's crew their new target for money and enslaving them. But their arrogance enraged Daejin and Dojiam to the point where they both punched them in the face, knocking them out. That's what they get for messing with Daejin's crew. Daejin and Dojiam were once enemies, but not for long. When they were still in Gangnam, Dojiam saw Daejin as a weakling who couldn't fight Yuzhang. Dojiam repeatedly tried to beat up Daejin, but his spirit was unbroken. Dojiam assumed that getting beaten up by him was Daejin's way of venting his rage because he couldn't destroy Yuzhang. Dojiam glared at Daejin, telling him that Hate Wang had murdered his father. Dojiam had no idea they would meet the same fate. Because of them, Daejin also lost a family member. Back at Deep Purple's hideout, Jun Zhong and Hai Zong are losing focus on attacking Daejin and Dojiam as a result of their argument. Things are starting to fall apart between them. They are now fighting over who will land the first punch on Daejin and Dojiam, and they have used that opportunity to strike Jun Zhong and Hai Zong. The more they argue, the more ground they are losing. When Dojiam finally provoked them, they dash towards Daejin and Dojiam and Hai Song grabbed Jin Zhang's hands, swinging him to attack them. However, Daejin and Dojiam managed to land a blow on both of their faces, rendering them unconscious once more. Because of their argument, they are losing their focus on attacking Daejin and Dojiam. The two are getting out of sync. They are now fighting over who's going to land a punch first on Daejin and Dojiam. They've taken that opportunity to land a blow on Jin Zhang and Hai Song. They are losing little by little while they are arguing. When Dojiam finally provoked the two, they dashes towards Daejin and Dojiam. He Sung grabs Jin Zhang hands to swing him to attack them, but Daejin and Dojiam manages to land a blow on both their faces that made them unconscious once again. As soon as they knock them up, they are trying to find a way to get out of the den, but unfortunately it is locked. It can only be opened with an access from the personnel of the establishment. While they are trying to think of a way to escape, he Song got a really strong gut to still wake up and gets a fire extinguisher to clunk open the pipe. The pipe is actually filled with pure concentrated substance that could destroy anyone inside the room when inhaled. That of course did not spare He Zhong who first inhaled the concentrated substance, knocked him out unconscious, and the rest of the intoxicated people inside the room is knocked out one by one by the concentrated smell. Dajin and Dojiam tries to kick the door open while trying not to inhale the substance. The gas masks that are lying on the floor is broken because of their fight, and after minutes both of them are slowly getting dizzy and everything is getting blurry. 
In their conscious mind, they hear multiple noises from outside the door, and someone just came to their rescue. It is Huizu. Huizu takes a deep breath and holds it in. He then carries Daijin and Dajian by his shoulders and rushes away from the den and the poisonous substance in it. Huizu feels a little short of breath. He is not sure if it's because he's carrying to guys or because he inhaled a little bit of the substance back there. Huizu can't take his grin off with what Daijin and Dojion just did, being reckless like he was in his younger years. One of Saiyang's men suddenly popped out of nowhere. He tries to swing the baseball bat to Huizu but because he is elusive, he knocked the man unconscious while using him as an obstacle, leaping forward and away from the enemy's den. A couple is talking outside Deep Purple, telling his girlfriend that there is good stuff there. When they are just about to enter, Saiyang suddenly pops out behind his back. At first, the man is annoyed with Saiyang because he sounded arrogant. But the moment he sees Saiyang and tells him that he is the owner of the establishment, he instantly sweats out of horror. Saiyang and his men are already waiting for the three of them. Even though Saiyang is grinning, the tension in the air gets heady with rage. He can't believe that Daijin wasted the opportunity to finally join them and stabbed him on their back, making them his enemies. Before Huizu could go out of the building, he already saw Saiyan's men outside. He puts the injured Daijin and Dojiyam aside, warms up his hands for another bloody battle alone. Moments before Huizu rushed into Lab H's den, his grandma was sleeping peacefully at Daijin's crew hideout. Weizu was very happy to see his grandma, who was very comfortable despite not being at their own house, and it was all thanks to Yundong's specialty of taking care of the elderly. Curious enough, Yundong asks Weizu about Daijin and Dogium's whereabouts, which Weizu quickly denies. It turns out that Daijin instructs Weizu not to tell the crew of his infiltrating Lab Ace Club with Dogium. But Weizu is growing more restless. Not only that, he has to lie to Daijin's crew just because Daijin tells him to do so, but it also bothers him to not be of any help to the people who saved him and his grandma. While Huizu is lost in his thoughts, the grandma wakes up and asks where's her grandson. Huizu quickly answers that he is there beside her, but the grandma refuses, saying that she's looking for the grandson she used to know. Huizu smirks and takes this as a sign that the real Huizu wouldn't just stand there and wait, and that's why Huizu comes to support Daijin and Dojiam at the Deep Purple Bar. Back to the present, Saiyang Huang gathers most of his gang and surrounds the entire bar from the outside. Saiyang instructs him to bring Daijin and his friend to him at that instant. But Huizu just barely escaped the den with Daijin and Dojiam, who were both still unconscious at that point. The substance is now making Huizu weary as well, and he must act quickly before Saiyang Huang's goons get to them. Huizu kicks a door and is astonished to meet him on the other side. It's the entire Daijin crew, all present to provide reinforcement to them. Weizu was greatly surprised because he thought no one saw him leave the hideout, but Undong is so sharp that he notices Huizu sneaking out. Daijin's crew carries Huizu, along with still conscious Daijin and Daijiam, back to their hideout and escape lab Ace's deep purple bar. And when Saiyang Huang arrives at the scene, not a single soul is to be found. Because of this, Saiyang Huang's disappointment in his gang grows even further, especially for the manager and assistant manager, Jun Zhang and Haesung Lee. The two beg for Saiyan's mercy, but due to Jun Zhang's high intoxication with their illegal substance, he suddenly started to violently slam his own face to the ground while apologizing and begging for mercy. Being the natural savage boss he is, Saiyan Huang's patience has no room for empathy and only displays further violence towards Jun Zhang. Saiyan grabs the manager by the face and then shoves down an illegal paraphernalia inside of his mouth forcefully and violently. The manager, Jun Zhang, falls to the ground and it is now time for Heejun Lee, the assistant manager, to face Saiyan's wrath. Heejun tries to beg his boss Saiyan for mercy one last time, but Saiyan only responds by terminating their position in the deep purple bar. Saiyan Huang orders Heejun to start working at the plant from now on. It is a much worse place to be than the deep purple bar because the plant is where the illegal substance is made. Heejun begs the boss to reconsider his decision, but Saiyan's orders are absolute and a failure like him has no right to question or refuse. Meanwhile, in Daijin's crew hideout, Dojiam and Daijin have now regained their consciousness, with Dojiam currently thanking Huizu for saving their skins. Huizu is flattered by Dojiam's appreciation, but Daijin thinks of the opposite. Daijin is mad at Huizu's recklessness, which might cost him his life if things go out of hand instead. 
Daejin also added that if something happens to Huizu, there will be no one else left to take care of his grandma. Huizu quickly realizes that Daejin is only concerned about him and his grandma, and immediately starts crying while denying that he is. On a serious note, Dojium raises his concern about the uncertainty of their future now that they attack Lab H. He is fully aware that sooner or later, Lab H will come knocking on their door to take revenge. But Huisu says not to worry, a bold statement that makes Daejin and Dojium very curious. Daejin asks Huisu what he exactly means. Huisu replies that their hideout is located in a special area where the four kings are not allowed to enter or conduct any business. The Four Kings are a combined faction of different crime organizations that stand over a very thin and fragile foundation of trust. Each of the Four Kings still looks for an opportunity to knock one organization out despite their formed alliance. So to act as a control or a neutral ground, the Four Kings delegate a special place called the Sanctuary, which is placed right in the middle of the Four Kings' territories. And the building that they are using as a hideout turns out to be conveniently placed inside this so-called Sanctuary. It is the first time Daejin and Dojiam to heard of this story, and they were greatly astounded upon hearing it. Daejin realizes that not only can they use this sanctuary as a safe place to hide, but also as an advantage to sneak behind the four kings. Just with the thought of it, Daejin's desires fueled with excitement and rage now that they have gained an ace under their sleeves. Especially right now that Yuzhong Shin's departure from Korea is coming near. Should they want to destroy the Hate Wang, they must act quickly before the head, Yuzhong leaves the country entirely. After hearing Daejin speak of Haegwang, Huizu raises his curiosity about why Daejin and Dojiam are so determined to destroy Haegwang. But before an answer from Daejin or Dojiam is spilled, a flashback comes into the scene. It was a flashback of Daejin all the way back to those days when he was still training to improve himself. And at that nostalgic moment, Hangul Joe is just there in front of him, casually relaxing under the sun. Moan paused as Hangul greeted the young Daejin. The flashback starts with a normal day for Hangul and his members inside a cozy room. They were waiting for Daejin to get home. Someone knocked on their door, they heard Daejin's voice, and they were happy to see his silhouette. When Daeup opened the door, he saw an injured young Daejin. His friend came to his rescue while he explained what happened to him. A few days passed, and on a sunny day, young Daejin, despite being injured, still did his chores. For the past few days after Daejin got hurt, Handel wasn't around with them, and Daeyeok got a little sulky with him. But he shrugged it off and got news that the gang that beat young Daejin up was completely wiped out. Despite Handel also having red marks on his fists, he tried to hide the fact that he was the one who beat the gang. He managed to tease and smile in front of young Daejin. In the present time, Yendong asks Daejin if he is already okay, and if the substance he inhaled from the den has already worn off. Daejin smiles at Undong and thanks him for backing them up from Lab H. To ease off Undong's worries, he tells him that his reward is 10 years of no housework. But of course, Undong doesn't want the members to think that he is getting special treatment, and then Daejin nervously smiles, telling him he is just kidding, making Undong think that the effect is not wearing off yet. Undong is with Huizu's grandma outside the building. He tries to stop the grandma from going outside because of the danger. But the grandma threatens Undong that she's going to take a dump there if he doesn't give her what she wants. It is talking a walk outside. Since they mentioned that their place is untouchable because of the Treaty of the Four Kings, even though Undong still has his worries, he tries to get on the positive side that they are safe. So he goes on a walk with Huizu's grandma. Huizu's grandma is happily walking with Undong, and he regrets not doing this to his own grandma. He starts to cry when grandma wipes his tears off. He couldn't hold his emotions off, and while he was trying to wipe his own tears, the black van at the side of the road suddenly opened and grabbed Huizu's grandma. Undong panics as he sees the grandma being taken away. He runs as fast as he can to keep up the pace with the car. Inside the car, the kidnappers inform their boss that their mission is successful. The night came and Undong ended up at the Lab 8 building. He also sees the car the grandma was in. He panics. He goes back to Daejin for help. He might not know what will happen to the grandma while he is gone. He remembers how calm the grandma's face was when she wiped his tears. That gives him the courage to enter the building and meet one of the Lab H executives. Inside Lab H, another one of Siang's executives tells him that they have Huizu's grandmother with them. They are sure that Huizu will go there because she is his weakness. Siang did not care about breaking the tree because Huizu stole something important from them that might end Lab H's business, 
so Saiyang also stole something important from Huizu in return. Late at night, Daejin hears a loud bang at the door. He hears Undong's voice, and he is utterly confused about what he is doing outside, but before he could complete his sentence, he saw Undong in a very bad state. Undong lost balance on the floor, which left Daejin rushing to him. Undong tells him that he's sorry, they got Huizu's grandma, and it's his fault. Daejin's face turns unpleasant, his temperature rises, and his eyes widen in rage. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, give a like and subscribe for more videos. See you next time.